Hello, I'm Neil Dunn, Chief Executive Officer for Polymateria. Polymateria is a British business that's developed a new technology called Biotransformation, which is an exciting solution for the global plastic pollution epidemic. Now, I've got here through a very uh, unusual and circuitous route. When I first left Belvedere College in Dublin in the early 90s, I was very much in love with sport, initially rugby in school, uh, but that morphed into 400 meter hurdling and later 800 meter running. And that took me all around the world, uh, Manhattan in New York, uh, Colorado, and then, and then ultimately at Atlanta. By the time I retired, when I was 26, it had left me really with two things, two parameters by which um, I think still define me to this day. The first was a real love of change. So understanding how do you change effectively and, and change the world around you? Of course, that all needing to start with yourself and understanding your own mental and physical limitations, but equally your, your strengths and how you can overcome one and maximize the other. But then ultimately um, building an environment around you that allows that to happen. And that's really about um, uh, recruiting others and mobilizing them and bringing them with you on the journey. The second parameter kind of aligned to that was was the power of big ideas, whether that you know big idea is, is pursuing an Olympic medal or uh, breaking a record or just being your best self. Um, big ideas have always struck me as being something that um, people yearn for and they, they really want to feel an attachment with something that is that is bigger than them, bigger, bigger than all of us. So when I was looking for a, a career, as my father said, uh, you know, to, to get a, a real job, um, Accenture, the management consultancy specialized in change, changing big businesses, changing big governments. And I really wanted to go in there and, and learn about that and how you would do that in, in those types of environments. Uh, about halfway through my 10 years in there, I found myself in the risk management practice. Um, this was before 2008. We spent a lot of time qualifying and quantifying the bigger cre biggest credit risks and market risks of, of um, banks and insurance companies and understanding what that meant in terms of their um, tier one capital ratios, their liquidity positions and so on. But in, in so doing, realize that that very same approach, that very same data, was also incredibly transformational in terms of its ability to spot opportunities and ultimately create products and services and businesses that solve the world's problems as opposed to creating the world's problems. So being able to really get yourself on the right side of history. And it was really that um, that was the, the, the cornerstone of the idea that created the sustainability practice within Accenture. Um, and we spent a couple of years kind of scaling that and growing that with some of the you know biggest uh, uh, businesses in the world. And then I went to the opposite end of the spectrum, really going back in many ways to um, that belief that I have in the, in the power of, of big ideas and worked in Saatchi and Saatchi in the sustainability practice, um, looking to see how brands like Procter & Gamble and Walmart and Vestas, Wind Energy Company and Toyota could all really utilize their, their power to touch and influence literally billions of people every day, but do so through sustainable product innovation and um, in an authentic and, and, and meaningful way, also get the world um, on their side. So those two skills together, all of course in, in advisory roles, um, but I really wanted to go in-house. And I went in-house into BT to do the chief sustainability officer role, purely because of the power of technology. And um, over the time that I was there, seven years, we also went into content, creating a, a TV channel on the back of lessons learned from the, the London Olympic Games, but using that content to drive take up in the broadband portfolio. And also then with the acquisition of EE with a, with a 4G network, integrating all of that together to create um, a, you know, a really purposeful business that had huge potential to both grow and deliver impact at the at the same time as well. Um, I then went into Polymateria to, to do a CEO role and, and take on that job, firstly because of the issue, because plastic pollution speaks to us in a way that uh, um, very few other environmental issues do. And, and whilst climate change and the acidification of the oceans and deforestation are probably more material in terms of their environmental impact, 
plastic pollution is very much the canary in the mine. So to be able to create a technology that could be a big part of the overall solution by solving that core innovation challenge was an incredibly exciting opportunity, which I've grabbed with both hands for the last two and a half years now. The great thing about working for a business like Polymateria is that your personal and professional values can come into alignment. And I know more and more people these days are asking themselves the question, how can who I am and what I do effectively become the same thing? And I think as you read more and travel more and get basically more perspective, the one thing that comes back is the urgency by which we need to act and change course. The United Nations is calling the next 10 years our decade of delivery, 10 years to deliver the sustainable development goals, which if you actually look at what we're trying to achieve is demanding exponential impact and growth, which is certainly not deliverable from the incrementalism of business as usual. So we really need to think differently. And if you look at in the last 10 years, where have exponential growth and impact come from? It's largely from unicorns that have either come and gone or have uh, come and actually are now fighting for their lives, whether that's Uber or WeWorks or Tyrannos, they've had aspects of brilliance, but fundamental flaws within their business model, which have caused them to miss their full potential. And if we're to create green unicorns that are capable of actually delivering the type of growth and impact that the UN is calling for, we need honest conversations about what it really takes to rewire and create those types of businesses. Here's a couple of things from my perspective that I've, I've found to be fundamental. The first is integrity. The reason you need integrity as the foundation of everything is that from the moment you put your head above the parapet and say, see that big environmental or indeed social issue over there, we're gonna solve that and do it through commercial means. You're gonna have every NGO, every academic, every person who sees themselves as the guardian of that issue trying to challenge you and scrutinize you. And um, ultimately, you're gonna to have to convince them that your science and your data and your evidence um, is, is, is sufficient to stand up to that, to that type of scrutiny. You're also going to be disrupting an incumbent system that has enjoyed a degree of primacy for probably a couple of decades or more, and they're not gonna go quietly without a fight. And in order to have any chance of winning that fight, you need to not have any uh, exposures and you need to be ensuring that that integrity is not just in your science, but flowing through the entire culture of your organization as well. On top of that, you need diversity. And I know diversity is um, very much used in the human rights sense at the moment, but I'm coming at it from the other side. And in doing that, saying, thinking about diversity from the perspective of where are you weak? What are your blind spots? What do you not know? What behaviors are you missing? What mindsets are you missing out on? And how do you fully fill out your team that has that complementary yet diverse set of skills and experiences that will ultimately cover blind sides and risks and issues that maybe you're not even thinking about as an organization today? On top of that, then, it's not enough to be a disruptive technology. You need to disrupt the entire system. So you need to build coalitions. You need to punch above your weight and understanding the system that you're a part of and where the leverage points are within those systems, be that creating new standards, um, shifting policy, um, mass engagement of consumers, working with disruptive, more agile brands to set trends that will ultimately lead big brands in that, uh, in that direction ultimately. All of those things are incredibly strategic decisions. Each one of them has a cost. So you need to be able to look your investors in the eye and explain why each of those costs is ultimately legitimized so that you are able to convince them that you're creating a market that doesn't even exist today by pulling all of those levers together. And in my experience, the investment community coming at this from a, an ESG or an SRI perspective is very much thinking about it from a, a risk management um, um, point of view, as opposed to really thinking about the cost of disruption across entire value chains and understanding the type of leadership and levers that you need to be able to pull to achieve that disruption and then putting their investment into those businesses so that we can create these types of 
green unicorns that have the integrity, the diversity, the coalitions associated with them that ultimately gives us the impact that the UN is calling for. Some of you will have noticed that I'm sharing these thoughts with you from home, which is where I've been for the last four months, leaving, of course, uh, to, to exercise, um, and on a handful of occasions to go and pick up a few basics, a few essentials. Um, but by and large, I've been, like the rest of you, trying to adapt and make sense of all the changes that the COVID-19 situation has wrought on our lifestyles and ways of working. There are surprising upsides. I found myself um, operating at an incredible level of efficiency and like many people in my position would have spent a huge amount of time traveling, being in airports and airplanes and uh, in different time zones so therefore uh, not hugely accessible and it could take weeks to line up a meeting whereas now myself and many other people like me are imminently more accessible. So being able to get into people's diaries literally within a couple of days has meant that you have uh, a stack of meeting after meeting from early morning to late at night, which allows you to cover a huge amount of ground. And I think from a throughput perspective is incredibly impactful. However, the downside of that is it's, it's not a natural state and it's not normal for us as humans to be operating and working in that way. And previously I would have had a natural pacing or a cadence, and it could be as simple as just leaving one building and going to the other or commuting or um, traveling to the airport and getting in a, a plane, picking up a book and flying from one side of the world to the other. And that disengagement from the machine is really where you create and it's where those random thoughts and those different ideas kind of come together to, to shape fresh thinking um, or come up with new solutions to very complex problems. And I think it was David Gilletner actually who studied that and, and made famous the whole concept of the poetry of human thought. And this is the thing that really differentiates us from machines is that ability to come up with those brilliant ideas when we're shaving or just doing something completely random and that eureka moment comes to us. And in this new world we're living in, all of that randomness is being eroded by these incredible efficient schedules that we are we are living to. And there also has to be an impact on mental health as well, where many of the um, peers and colleagues that I speak to inside and outside the business are finding that there's just a, a real um, lack of human connection and a lack of that real feeling of um, support and um, uh, uh, community. Um, even in this, this virtual world, you don't really get that sense of um, familiarity and togetherness. And that can really create a lot of loneliness, even if you are incredibly busy and spending an awful lot of time actually talking with people, you're not actually with people. On the other side of things, I found that from a business perspective, one of the things I've been most proud of over the last couple of months is the way our people at Polymateria have stepped forward. And I think it speaks to the things I was talking about earlier around how you have to create a culture of integrity and diversity and bring the world with you. I think the time and attention that you spend on culture at times like this where COVID-19 is throwing challenges at us that literally we never could have expected. If all of that relies on one person within the business, you have a single point of failure, you're going to fall over. And seeing leaders in our business step forward at all levels and look at our policies and our procedures and see what changes we needed to make to allow for social distancing, PPE, um, commuting and getting people in and out of work without having to deal with public transformation and threat all of that, not having to furlough anybody and keep all of our commercial projects and R&D projects moving forward and having that happen organically from within the business because people believe in the cause and they want to go the extra mile and they really 
um, um, will will volunteer their energies and their passions in a way that just um, is is incredibly impressive. So I think that has been one of my proudest moments um, as the CEO of this business, and I think also really gives us a slingshot as we come out of this and get back to more normal ways of working. There has been, I think, a galvanizing of the culture, a really a real commitment to the cause. And I think an acknowledgement that we do as an organization have leaders at, at all levels of the business, which is the type of resilience as a CEO that you, you really worry um, that you don't have. Um, and, and I think the greatest testament of any leader is, is being able to create more leaders. Um, and I think if we can all say we, can, we, we are doing that and achieving that, well, I think we can uh, sleep well at night, regardless of if it's within the context of COVID-19 or just our, our normal um, day-to-day business operations. So in terms of what the future holds for me, I have a sense of it, but one thing I know from past experience is that whatever you think your plan A is going to be, it's not going to be that. It's not even going to be plan B. It will be something else entirely. But if I was to try and describe the parameters by which I think as this new world emerges, I need to be successful. The first is learning how to bring energy into networks and into situations where you can't really rely anymore on the power of being in the room. That was a huge um, source of fulfillment for me, if I'm being honest. I got huge energy out of top level meetings with policy makers, business leaders and really connecting with their um thoughts and ideas and, and showing what we were doing at Polymateria um, was, was a missing link in, in many ways for them. Um, that sense of fulfillment, um, you know, has morphed into now needing to do that and be probably just as effective doing it, but doing it in a virtual sense. And to be honest, um, I don't have a feel for how much trust you can develop and how deep those relationships will be in this new world. Does it wind up being as transactional as everything else that happens online? I don't have a sense of that yet, but I'm definitely leaning into it to try and figure it out. Second thing is how to create that uh, culture. Uh, Again, uh, aligned to the first point, being able to um walk into our laboratories walk into the imperial innovations ecosystem that we're part of and you know really get a flavor for the mood and the atmosphere and um almost sense you know where where we were uh at in terms of our motivation levels um the the passion and the conviction if if something was holding us back you could you could very 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 quickly read the signals that's next to impossible to do as we host um, you know monthly all hands calls and are sharing different developments of the strategy invariably everybody's putting their best foot forward all of the time and therefore getting a sense of where your real problems are and and real issues um, can be can be a challenge um, However, I think the one thing that I've found by almost over-indexing on the amount that you're communicating and the amount that you're actually questioning and, and deliberately waiting for responses to come back, and when they do come back, really following through and showing that you're paying attention to any concerns within the organization, I think that has... Um, proven to be something that has worked effectively and something I'll continue to do uh, even when we return back to some semblance of of normalcy. And then finally, people like me have to deliver. And it's all well and good to sit in front of you and say that uh, you're thinking about and actively practicing how you fundamentally rewire the way business works so that you bring the world with you so that you have the power of diversity on your side so that you've got integrity flowing through everything else 
you're doing now anyone can write a book on that and anyone can research the case studies but the actual tangible examples of businesses who have done it who have become billion pound plus valuations as a consequence of doing it and avoided all the pitfalls that we spoke about earlier are few and far between so really it's about the next couple of years um, delivering and proving that this is a better way of running a business and that the short-termism and the uh, quarterly um, uh, shortcutting that can go on to just try and deliver the numbers at the expense of everything else, that all of those things um, will ultimately um, allow you to rise above um, and to create an organization that's incredibly valuable, commercially successful, but equally has um, the, the world on its, on its side. Um, so in terms of what the future holds for me, it's ultimately about, you know, proving that this is the right way of doing things. And at the end of the day, just like in my athletics career, you know, you get judged by the numbers. You are either a 146, 147, 148, 800 meter runner um, or you're, you're not. Um, and uh, I think as a, as a CEO, we get judged by the numbers as well. Um, you can have a different philosophy and it can sound more colorful and it can sound way more enticing and, and way more in, uh, interesting but you ultimately are judged by the numbers so for me uh you know i certainly intend to put all of this into practice and, and give the world something that they can look to so that many more polymaterials will emerge uh, in our decade of delivery One of the challenges in answering the question, how has COVID-19 impacted on us and will everything fundamentally change or will this all just blow over, is to paint a picture based on those two extremes. Where on the one hand, we're already seeing many examples of us being encouraged to return to normal, to go back to um, our way of lives as they were before, embrace herd immunity and play down the issues associated with that particular approach and then when necessary use conspiracy theories and other means to point the finger and the blame elsewhere or maybe at the other end of the spectrum to talk about this as being the end of globalization that the type of free movement of trade and people that we've grown accustomed to over the course of our lifetimes is now no longer fit for purpose and what will re-emerge in this new world order will be something that is much more limited and a lot less human. I think in between those two extremes, you can start to see the pieces of what hopefully will happen begin to emerge. And we've already seen many examples of that, even before COVID-19, where thanks to the digital revolution, we have been thinking globally, but acting locally for quite some time. But when you couple that with hyperconsumption and the need for resources without sustainability developed into the thinking of us as individuals or the businesses who are serving that demand, we really are on a path that has serious issues associated with it. So being able to benefit from the type of cause, the type of purpose that COVID-19 has reinvigorated in us. And you can see so many examples around us in the world today. Firstly, starting with health, the way our health systems had to pivot to empower hospitals, doctors, frontline workers, but we were all on board with them. We were all part of that mission. We were all unified in that challenge. And we have that type of urgency and that type of pace and cadence that you need to act really as a community that's together on a particular issue. And one of the hopes that I would have is that we emerge out of this crisis, that that community that has been reinvigorated, whether it's digital or real world communities, and actually those two things blending together, that we now have built the muscles within the fabric of our society, whereby we're actually able to respond to potentially bigger threats like climate change, but use those same types of approaches to empower people much more bottom up to actually look at what we are dealing with and what the issues are, but actually make sure that the action, the togetherness, the ability to look after 
the most vulnerable within our communities, that all of that is something that we continue to benefit from even after this uh, pandemic has passed. And I think then from an investment perspective, it starts to set the trend away from a monopoly of centralized systems, where previously from an investment perspective, the big bets that you needed to make on infrastructure, on food and agriculture was born out of many more people in emerging markets, many more people living in cities. The um, trends were a lot easier to spot. Whereas now I think the investment landscape is going to be defined by a lot more uncertainty, but the winners are going to be the ones who really understand this much more decentralized, digital-based way of working and how to actually put the power back in the hands of citizens, in the hands of consumers, and ultimately do that in a way that taps into their need for urgency, the passion and the purpose that they all feel. And whether you're a brand, whether you're a government, whether you're a media outlet, doing that authentically and bringing the world with you, certainly as we emerge from COVID, is going to become the new normal. So hopefully that has all been helpful to you. I know you have listened to the story of my own personal development, the journey of polymateria, the exciting opportunity that sits in front of all of us and how we're making sense of this new world in terms of our own culture, but also observations on the world around us. Thanks for tuning in. And by all means, feel free to get in touch with me through any of the social media platforms that either I or my colleagues are uh, imminently accessible on. Thank you.